Hi, and welcome to this Sustainable Landscape Workshop on how to construct a sustainable landscape. Uh, my name is Ken Cruz, I'm the Sustainable Director for the Town of Winchester. This workshop is being held on Saturday, May 20th, 2023 at Winchester Public Library. Special thanks to the library for hosting us today. Today's workshop is one part of a larger project being undertaken jointly by Winchester, Arlington, and Stone. And this three-town project includes workshops like the one today, but also the creation of a sustainable landscape handbook that will be ready by the, by the end of the year. Uh, joining me today is one of my co-project directors, David Morton, from uh, the town of Arlington. He's the environmental planner there. <coughs> Unfortunately, Erin Morton, the director of planning and community development uh, in Stone, couldn't be here today, but she's also a key partner. Our presenters today are Leslie Fanger and also Lindsay Corsi from Polar Engineering, which is a firm that has expertise in uh, landscape architecture and design and construction, among other things. Uh, today's workshop is the second in three part series. The first one was held in Stone about a month ago. That was on designing the sustainable landscape. Today's, of course, is on, today's workshop is on implementing a sustainable design for your uh, landscape. And the third will be held in Arlington on June 8th at 11 in the morning at the Arlington Community Center, and that's on maintaining the sustainable landscape after you've planned it and implemented it. Uh, we'll be filming today's workshop, and a recording will be available on all three town websites. I'm not going to read through the URLs for you right now, but you should find it pretty easily just by Googling. Um, I want to thank uh, Arlington Community Media for providing uh, the camera that we're using today and also for editing this video after the fact. We appreciate it. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Thanks, Ken. Uh, as Ken mentioned, this is a, a second in a series of three workshops that we're doing in conjunction with um, preparing this guidebook. Um, the, the funding came through the, uh, the state. Ken, can you help me with the name of the grant? Um, uh, Accelerating Climate Resilience, it's a grant mm -hmm. from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. There we go, thank you very much. Um, so, at the end of all of the workshops, uh, we're going to take all the information that we've gathered through um, the process of, of pulling the workshops together and prepare a guidebook. Um, this uh, was a result, or getting the grant was uh, uh, building on another um, sustainable <coughs> project that we did for the town of Concord, and uh, it was very well received and it's being, being used very well there. And so we're sort of building off of that experience with, with this workshop and uh, the guidebook as well. So we want to try to educate and encourage residents, businesses, uh, landscape contractors, uh, property managers, condominiums, all anyone who's doing any work uh, in the environment, landscaping, we want to make sure that um, they are aware that there are options to the traditional um, kind of unsustainable practices that we, we all grew up with, we need to. So, um, so again, uh, we're in the second, this is the, uh, today at the Winchester Library, third will be all on how to sustainably take care of your landscape. Even if you didn't start with a sustainable um, mindset, there are ways that you can uh, make your, your land more sustainable and uh, provide a healthy environment for you, your pets, the animals that visit your property, and all the bugs and insects that, that help make um, the world go around, as they say. So the agenda, what we're going to do is just you know, do a quick review of the principles of sustainable landscape. Um, we started with design, that was a workshop that, uh, did any of you attend that one? Yeah, good, I thought I had some familiar faces, that's great. Um, and again, uh, that was recorded as well. So um, if you're interested in learning more about sustainable design and want to see the presentation that was given at that time, it's available on the town websites. 
Uh, durability is definitely something you don't want to spend a lot of money and then have it uh, not work. So we want things to be durable. Um, energy efficiency, try to get things out of the waste stream, reduce uh, what you're using, and use uh, less of it if you can. Um, we want to increase the amount of rainfall that gets back into the ground and help support all the aquifers that many communities depend on for their drinking water. Um, and then uh, dovetail on that, water conservation. Use less water because it's a real resource that um, is uh, in jeopardy in a lot of communities. Uh, maybe not here in, in Winchester or Arlington or Stoneham, but in Concord, it was, uh, they were really worried about their, their water resources, which was uh, why they wanted to start talking more about sustainable energy. Um, and then try to get materials that are durable and maybe sourced locally. Um, so at the end of the presentation, we're going to do a little activity that kind of gets you thinking about your own yard and uh, playing the board games. And I made it up, so <laughs> I think it'll be fun and give you a chance to collaborate and, uh, and learn a bit more. So, uh, principles of sustainable landscape construction. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we want to conserve water and energy, reduce waste, decrease runoff, um, and make sure that soil is really a valuable uh, entity in your landscape. Um, it supports all your plants and supports the ecosystem with all its values um, that we don't need to go into. But um, So we did the sustainable design, and uh, now we're going into talking about construction. Um, when we talk about creek water as a resource, so what does that mean? It means, um, you know, don't leave the hose on longer than you need to. Make sure you don't have leaks in your hose. Um, uh, you know, turn turn the faucet off when you're brushing your teeth. Yeah, that's all sort of common sense things, but it also applies to the outside when you're doing landscape projects or maintaining your your plants. Try to get something uh, a plant that's a native plant. Um, we're suggesting we we understand there are some beautiful plants that everyone loves and wants to plant, but maybe as you start to transition towards um, more natives. Trying to get it about maybe 70 30 of, of, of native plants, 70%, maybe 30% of those, those beautiful ones that, that maybe aren't native, but you really love them. Uh, I know I have lots of them in my own yard. I'd like to think it's about that blend, though. Um, remove invasive species. This is a big one um, that's pushing out our native uh, plant species. Um, birds, bees, insects, everything else. Um, if you have the native species, they're kind of pushing the good native uh, materials out. Uh, so they're just very aggressive. And, and in my own yard, I'm really making an effort to like go around and just pull them all out. But we'll talk about that um, some more. Um, again, the old adage: uh, reduce, reuse, uh, and recycle. So this is going to be sort of their organizing um, principles uh, for our presentation. So um, I'm not going to read all of these because we're just going to jump right into it. Um, so prioritize based on budget. And Lindsay and I are just going to tag team a little bit on this. So Lindsay, you want to? Sure. Here you go. Yes. Press the yeah. Okay, so um, step step two. Analyze what you can accomplish now, what needs to wait. So you're not going to be able to do everything that you ever will want to do to your yard in a given year, and based on whatever budget you have available, right? You got to set aside however much you're willing to spend in a given period of time, and what you can reasonably get done um, with your budget over that course of time. So, I'm um, Yeah. 
<laughs> um, and so once you figure that out, you need to figure out who is actually going to be doing the work that you set that budget aside for. Um, is it going to be you? Is it going to be a contractor? Are you going to tag team it? Um, and if it is you, you need to understand what you are reasonably capable of doing physically. So like, you can't just neglect the, the cost of physical labor on your body and the cost of time that it takes to do a project. It's going to take longer to do something yourself than if you hire a contractor. So just because something's cheaper to do by yourself, um, that doesn't mean that you should negate the other factors that you are going to have to put in to accomplish that piece of work, that project. So if you are going to hire a contractor, um, get multiple bids from reputable sources before you start the work. Just make sure that you're hiring who you want to hire. Do your research. And um, if you're going to do a combination of you and the contractor, all of the, the steps will go. So then next, you know what your budget is. You know what projects you want to accomplish. Um, you know what your timeline is, how much time you have to um, get things done that you want to get done. So, the only thing that you don't have yet is your tools and your materials. Um, so, likely you'll have to purchase these things, but um, in the case of tools, I mean, it depends what you're going to be needing. Do you need hand tools? Are you going to have to rent um, construction equipment from somebody? Does your neighbor have something that you don't that you can ask them to use? You might not necessarily need to go out of your way to um, spend money and get the things that you don't have if you know people who have those things. So if you do need construction equipment, um, so like I said before, it, you have to figure out, um, be realistic with yourself about what you are able to accomplish by hand. Um, for instance, like, we have this photo down here of sod being ripped up. These pictures are actually courtesy of Winchester's very own uh, Ken Pruitt. He's doing um, landscape work in his yard. And you can see here, um, sod is being removed. The existing one is being removed and rolled up by this machine here. Um, you know, is that something that you're able to do by yourself with manual tools with a shovel? With, are you able to do that or do you need to hire someone to do it? So really think about the process of um, whatever project you're trying to accomplish in your yard and just be practical. Um, you don't want to start getting into something by hand and then realize you're in over your head and your body hurts and your back hurts and you can't get it done um, quickly. Also, if you're going to use construction equipment, if someone else is going to be operating equipment, driving a truck into the yard for delivery, or using some other piece of equipment, how are they going to get there? Do you have a fence? Do you have a gate? Are you going to have to, you know, change some things about your yard or your neighbors so that things, so vehicles can get in and out of your yard? Um, these are things that you need to think about because when the truck pulls up and then you realize your driveway isn't wide enough for the delivery truck to get through, I mean, these are things you have to think about before before you get to this point. Um, and before you do any kind of digging, um, just call Big Safe. It's free. Before construction, um, to figure out what kind of utilities might be underground in your yard. Um, if you're just doing small projects by hand, smaller things might not necessarily be necessary, but um, it doesn't hurt. Also, you can check MassMapper, which is Massachusetts um, GIS website, where you can also find similar information like how close you are to wetlands or bodies of water, if there's like any conservation areas that you should be aware of, or like really important um, like native habitat areas that you would like to know about. Um, you can pretty much find any of this information and tons more on MassMapper. So it just might be interesting to, to look into and see what's going on on your property and around your property. So, um, you've got your project. Now, where are you going to put it? How large is your project going to be? What is your project area in your yard? Um, the best way to visualize this is to lay it out physically 
in your yard with either a garden hose, wood stakes, spray chalk, landscape flags, rope, or you can edge using a shovel to outline your area if you have like a garden bed that you want to put in um, or something like that. Um, this will just give you an idea of spatially what you're working with, and then you can figure out how much material you need based on um, the area, the square footage of what you've outlined. So this will help you come up with um, estimated costs for materials that you need. Mm -hmm. Right, we were talking about uh, removing invasive species, and uh, it's really part of the, the site preparation. The, the whole goal is to get rid of things that are bad, like invasive species, Russian olive, bittersweet. Um, oh, there's the, the, the list is, is very long, unfortunately. Um, so that's a, always a first step, and that's something that you can do, like garlic mustard is this little plant, and just to let you know, we are going to be giving you uh, a list of invasive species as a handout, so um, it'll be part of the game. <laughs> um, but uh, some, some of the invasive species you can just key in your yard, you can just rip it out and, and make sure it doesn't go to seed as you're done. Um, some invasive species needs a bit more um, help than that. Uh, so you can just go and keep cutting it back, cutting it back until it just dies. It's not getting its nutrients and it's, it's gone. Um, if you're going to use herbicide, be very, very careful about how you use it. The best method of using herbicide, rather than just taking Roundup and, and spraying it all over the place, um, it, it will stay in the ground forever. So uh, in order to do it responsibly, you can just cut whatever plant you have. You know, if there's a little bit of a trunk, you just paint the herbicide on the trunk rather than spraying it everywhere. Okay? Um, it will take a little bit longer for the for the uh, trunk to die, but it will over time and have minimal impact to the soil around it. Okay? Um, as soon as you're done removing invasive species get something back in that's going to be happy and take over, and that's something that should be a native plant, okay? Um, so if you do have a plan in place, you've done your design, you're, getting, you're, you're implementing it now, you've gotten rid of all the invasive species, you're gonna be planting new native shrubs and trees, um, but you have one or two or three or a whole bunch of plants that uh, really are kind of in the way of your new design. You want to create space with a nice little sitting area. And right in the middle of the sitting area is a shrub that you love. So you might as well just dig it up and move it. All right? Transplanting is very good thing to pay for that plant. Uh, it's taken a while to get established, but it's, it's still valuable. Um, so. The process um, is transplanting, you just dig it up, you put it aside, you make sure it's all watered, make sure that the hole where it's going to is already prepared, so it's simply just taking the thing up, walking it over, or wheelbarrowing it over, and, um, and putting it in, in the hole that's already there. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll show you the process of uh, Installing, we've got a couple videos that shows that, so we don't need to spend too much time uh, talking about that. But watering is absolutely essential. I think that's pretty pretty well known. <laughs> um, so sod rolls. I think um, Ken had a nice example of how you can just take a machine. Uh, you could probably uh, go to a rental store and rent the sod remover, and it pulls it in a nice little roll. And then you can put it aside, and if you have other lawn areas that you want to um, increase, you can just use that side over. Um, and then another important aspect of construction or landscape construction is making sure that the soil that you have will support the plants that you want to install. So you can um, go to the UMass Extension Service, 
you spend a little dabbing of your existing soil so that you can figure out, okay, does it have the nutrients that it needs to support plant life? And if not, what do you need to do to make sure that the, the soil will support the plant life? And this, it's, it's really inexpensive and so worth it. And sometimes, you know, if, if I'm on a job site, I'll dig multiple holes and send multiple samples because it's amazing how different soil composition can be, even in one yard. Um, so it, it's good to be aware of, of what your soil is, um, is made of. So yeah, it's just a, a simple Ziploc bag, and, um, and I'll keep going. And I'll send it back within a week with a whole list of instructions on you need phosphorus, you need more organic matter, you need uh, you have a very clay-type soil, so you need to loosen it up with sand. Um, and it will tell you exactly what you need to do. It's, uh, it's a very valuable resource that our state provides all citizens of, of Massachusetts. Um, another thing, when, you're, when you start digging up dirt, and we have a day like today where it starts raining, and all the dirt starts running onto the road, or running into your plant beds, or what have you. It's important to kind of make sure that you retain that and call that um, erosion control because you, uh, you don't want concentrations of water to start to scur, uh, 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 what's the word? <laughs> Score. Score, thank you. Or just undermine the soil and uh, make it just this big gully that you have to deal with. So, um, ways to keep um, soil in place are, you know, things like jute mesh if you're on a slope. Uh, retaining walls, a good way to just, um, if you have a slope that you want it to be level, it's the easiest way is to just uh, build it up with a retaining wall. Um, you could do a little stream bed that's kind of a, uh, a faux stream full of rocks, and when it does rain, it, it, it has. Um, the ability to, to flow without damaging the soil. Or something like a rain garden. Um, this is a, a great uh, way to do a whole bunch of ecological uh, benefits to your yard. So you're retaining um, water, you're planting plants within the rain garden, and you're providing the ecosystem all those benefits like the butterflies and and the beauty of, of flowering plants and shrubs. Okay. Um, and back over to <laughs> our shopper. <laughs> Yay! Now we go to the fun part. So, now you go shopping. Um, so, since this is a discussion about sustainability, it's always best to, you know, if you have stuff already, use it. If you know somebody wants to get rid of stuff, use it. If you can find stuff on Facebook Marketplace or on the side of the road, use it. Just be creative. Um, you know, the, the less that you are buying new things that have to be transported to you and maybe aren't made sustainably, the better. Um, but if you are going to buy new things, it would be great if they're locally sourced, if they're um, made from recycled materials, if they're pervious or permeable, like papers, um, and then it, you know, it doesn't take a lot of energy to create those materials. Um, repurposed, reclaimed, recycled things, awesome. You can pile like old brick or old stone somewhere in your yard. Just see if you can use it before you um, jump to buying new materials. And you'll save money in the process, right? So. I don't like that term, free cycle. Yeah, free cycle. Yeah. <laughs> so here's just some examples of how you can get creative with um, painting in particular. Um, so these are all pervious options, meaning that water can easily percolate into the ground. Water, the ground has storm water issues where there's just sheets of water um, flowing off of the hard state material and into the nearby body of water along with all the, the pollutants from the cars that have been carried with it, right? So we want pervious options if possible. So these are all good alternatives to the traditional like asphalt concrete. You can do interlocking concrete pavers. Those also make some grass growing between them. 
you have a driveway like this or even a patio like this, you can do something simple like a crushed gravel driveway. It's cobblestone, a permeable brick. So water is able to pass through all of these and recharge into the ground. Pervious asphalt. There really is a thing called pervious asphalt. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> See, what this picture is trying to show us is that the water is staying in this one spot where it's being poured, right? It's not running off the sides. Um, and it's not going to cause, like, how Lisbon is talking about the erosion issue, where water is just running and, like, scoring hillsides because it's running so fast, it's taking all the soil with it. And you can see here, it's just, it's just falling right into the ground. It's pervious. Yeah, I, I can add a little to that. It's, it's technology that's been de um, developed uh, actually at UNH in New Hampshire, and it's very specific um, open uh, asphalt system, and you have to have uh, this um, very pervious material underneath the asphalt. So it's not like you go get a new um, driveway and you're saying more asphalt. It's not automatically going to be pervious asphalt. You have to request it specifically. Um, but it's much more prevalent in the marketplace these days. In fact, there's a great example in Sudbury. Um, all of the asphalt on that site, it's uh, Colbert uh, Crossing. Um, on what one said, if you drive up in there, every bit of the asphalt there is pervious. Colbert uh, Crossing? Is, is it durable? Yes, you do have to maintain it. Um, and <laughs> there's a special vacuum that uh, you do have to make sure that the pores within the asphalt stay open. So in order to do that, you take a lot of the you know, things off in the sky, the leaves start to um, disintegrate, and they start to fill in. So part of maintaining pervious asphalt is to vacuum it. And it's a special machine. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, all of these options here are pervious, also referred to as permeable or porous. They all pretty much mean the same thing. It's that water is able to pass through them into the ground. Um, fresh gravel or shell, or like a ribbon driveway like this, where um, you're ultimately doing less paving overall because you just have two strips for tires. That's a good option because you're just you're not. It's not as much material. You can have grass in the middle, or crushed stone, or cobblestone, or something like that. There's tons of variations of this um, type of design, but the idea is just that um, you don't need as much surface area of paving material. You just need straight for tires. And the term that we're trying to move away from in construction is impervious, because the very nature of impervious is that Water hits it and runs off and takes all of the oil and so forth with it and ends up in our rivers and streams and groundwater. Oops, some more shopping items. Uh, Similar to what I already mentioned, these are just some like ideas of what you can, what kind of materials you can get without spending money, hopefully, maybe. Um, like pallets. Brick. Rocks. I know you all have rocks in your eyes. <laughs> you, you do a little bit of digging, you're going to get a pile like this, right? Well, you can do something with it. You can make like a dry, um, a dry riverbed, dry stream. Um, I think we had a picture of it on a previous slide, but it looks nice when you like add plants. It looks very lush. It just looks like a stream bed that dried up, and it's um, it's it's good for that. Um, plant swamps. I would say like. If you guys aren't in Facebook groups already for like plants or gardening or whatever, just join them if you're interested. There's so like it's just a wealth of information. Everyone sharing things, asking questions. It must feel really good to like be able to answer somebody's question and like know the answer and you're the guru on that specific topic. But um, there's a lot there's a lot of resources available um, online. Groups of people that are doing things like this, plant swaps and um, have free things that you can come and pick up that they don't want anymore. You don't just think about those things because you don't necessarily have to go 
by yourself in terms of you have an idea of who you are. Um, urbanite, this is something I discovered recently, but it's just a term for basically old concrete that's been used and it's broken now. Look at this nice patio and walkway. Um, it looks like natural stone almost, but it's just crushed concrete. Who would have thought? Um, another application for that, here's a picture of raised fender that's same material. It's just concrete. Um, used up concrete that nobody wants. Okay, so um, supposing you do buy new materials like maybe mulch or stone dust or something, um, you need to prepare for how that's getting to your house, right? You're probably going to get it delivered. If you are getting it delivered, um, similar to what we mentioned prior to this slide, like you need to account for the space that a truck needs to back into your driveway or wherever you need that material to because once that pile of material is dumped in your yard, it's staying there until you come in with a wheelbarrow or a shovel. It's just you and a wheelbarrow back and forth, right? So there's some planning involved in that, especially if you have a big yard and you have multiple projects going on. You need to do some staging to ensure that your pile of materials is not going to incur more physical labor on your part going back and forth with distributing the mulch or stone dust or whatever plant material. Um, you want it to be close to where your project site is, but not on top of your project site so that you can't work because you have a giant pile of mulch in your way. Also, um, if it's going to be sitting out for multiple days or more, you need to make sure that you have like a tarp or something to cover it if it rains. Um, it's a lot easier to shovel wet stone dust or mulch than dry. Um, you'll want to probably have a tarp that it will be delivered on so that you don't get the material all, um, I mean, if you just have like a driveway, you probably can just dump right on the driveway and have a tarp, but I would recommend using a tarp. Um, so yeah, just, you need to do like some special planning and staging for delivery. So now we're at the install. Um, so you have your plant materials. Say you have a tree that you need planted. So first things first, you want to avoid creating areas where there's going to be standing water. It is possible to plant a tree too low in the ground, and then you're more susceptible to rot, and it's just stressful for the plant and possibly fatal. Um, you can do a soil test to determine what your your soil might need. Um, if you're using all the native plant materials. You probably will need to do two work to amend the soil. Um, but if you do get uh, amendments for the soil, you want to spread them throughout the area where the roots are going to, where the tree roots are going to spread. And as far as timing for planting, fall and spring are best. So if you're going to do it in the spring, do it before um, the buds break. And if you're going to do it in the fall, September and then October. It's just less stressful for the tree. Um, if you're going to be like planting in summer, it's just it's just so hot. It's going to be really stressful, and it's going to take longer for that plant to get acclimated to its new environment. So that's why these time periods are really really best to do any kind of new planting. So add to that, you you know, we've all planted things out of these um, seeds, maybe not in winter, although I have done that in a snowstorm, um, <laughs> but. Um, you know, these are just good practices, best practices, and um, if the tree is leaved out, it's, it's okay. It, it just, you need to work harder to make sure that that tree will um, get established. And how high you when you plant a tree, how, where, where should the tree be above ground? Yeah, so um, you can see the, the detail right there. And we're going to show you a video of the process of digging the tree, you know, planting the tree. Um, but typically you like the, so you have a tree, and the tree transitions into its root system. That's called the flare. You want that flare to be either, I'd say slightly above, an inch, maybe an inch and a half, two inches, slightly above the adjacent ground. Um, 
A lot of times when you plant a tree, it'll settle. So that extra buffer helps to make sure it isn't too deep. The worst thing you can do to any plant is plant it too deep. So there's several ways that you might receive plant material that you're planting. Either he's all in burlap. He's got a burlap sack around it and probably some wire. It's just a ball of roots. Um, you know, they, they, they harvest the tree out of the ground and basically package it like so. Or plants can be in containers, more common for smaller things like shrubs, but both can be either all burlap or containerized. Um, or bare root, which I think is less common than you would receive material like that if you order from a nursery, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you, it is less expensive and the plant material is smaller when you get it. Yeah. If your desire is to have a fairly mature looking tree, then you probably end up getting a ball and burlap variety. Um, yeah. yeah, so just like the, the way that you install varies a tiny bit based on how you're going to receive your material. So we'll get into that. So um, specifically for plants that are ball and burlap, you want to dig a hole that's two to three times wider than the, um, the burlap ball itself. And the hole, you only want it to be as deep as the uh, root ball. So um, like Leslie mentioned, you have a root flare where the chunk and the roots meet to be slightly above the existing ground, the existing grade. Um, because you don't want to plant it too low, and you just want to account for that settling so that it doesn't end up being too low below the ground. Um, so the best practice now is to cut all of the burlap away if you're able. Um, I know I have just like cut the top off before and thought that that was fine. You just like, peel it back, take the wire off, and left the burlap thinking it's biodegradable. Um, but I think the, the newer, better standard is that if you are able to, I know it's heavy, but if you can get all of the foreign material off the burlap and the wire, that is the best case scenario and um, your roots will be able to spread out more easily. So here's a video of how that works. Did you figure out how to get this? Um, yeah, that's The red button? Yeah, I just can't find how to press it. And 
so we can get all the soil around it. And so that's why having a little bit of soil at the base does help in keeping everything straight and kind of held together. So while Tim is taking off the wire basket, I'm going to start taking off the twine. And as I said, if you have a knife or hand printers, whatever you need to actually cut that twine, it's great. You don't want to leave that on the, around the base of the trunk of the tree. You'll notice our tree is a little bit crooked. We'll still have to manage that a little bit as we begin to fill the hole back in. Be really careful that you don't cut yourself uh, with the, the wire basket and set that off to the side. How do you live? A lot of nurseries use uh, wire staples now, and some will also still use the old fashioned pin nails. But either way, you're going to pull back the top of the burlap out away from the root ball itself. Because remember, we still have to expose the first mini word of root, and we want to make sure we don't leave any burlap on the top because oftentimes it will whip moisture away from the root ball uh, when you're trying to keep it well watered. We can see kind of that this is indeed a very sandy soil. So we're going to start maneuvering the tree to manage that, that leaf a little bit, and we're going to pull the soil off of the top of the tree, up off the top of the root ball. And you can see right where my hand is, is the first main order root that we talked about. And that's simply the first root that you encounter as you come down the trunk of the tree and into that root ball. And we want that, that root right at grade level, or no more than two to three inches above grade. So you can see we did very well in deciding how deep we want it or what it actually be. We still have a little bit of lean on this tree, and what we'll do is we'll stake the root ball so we'll be able to adjust for that once we finish. The next thing, of course, is to fill the hole itself with soil. Is that that's easy? <laughs> <laughs> it two minutes. <laughs> Um, so the container trees, it's basically the same process. Um, I should say container trees or trunks or anything like this. Um, but an added layer to that is, like, you know sometimes you take a plant out of the container and you can see the shape of the cylinder that it was in, the roots are just like so tightly bound in that shape. Um, that's called the root bound or pot bound meaning that the roots are just so um, tightly wound within themselves, they had no room to go outside the container, right? They outgrew um, the space that they had to grow in, in that container. So when that happens, we take it out, you see that they're like really tightly coiled. If you just place them in the ground like that, you know, they're not, the roots are not going to be encouraged to go outwards into the native soil that we want them to do. So what you need to do is um, gently break apart, spread out those roots at the bottom, get them untangled so that they are um, able to quickly spread out once you plant. So they will quickly be anchored in the soil um, because they're encouraged to spread outwards like they want to do. So they're not in the shape anymore. Um, so if you have like a like a shrub, like a small, like a granular shrub, you can cut like an X on the bottom of the, um, the root ball, or with your fingers, just break them apart. But you know, be gentle. Don't just start like hacking away at the roots. Like just take your time to be gentle with it. Um, so same goes for a, a tree or a uh, container shrub. So here's a video on how that works. <laughs> what did you do?
giving you a shovel. The painting just kind of straight, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have a video for this one, but there are trees. Um, basically, it's just the roots in, in no um, extra planting media material. It's just the plant, the roots. Um, so it's a similar plant planting process, but um, these types of plant material are really, they're more fragile than the other kinds because they're just so exposed. Um, one thing that you can do with fallen burlap or container materials is root washing, which is basically getting them from being in a container or a root ball to this, to bare root. Um, so the other methods are fine, but if you're able, um, this could be like best case scenario. Is root washing, I should say, is basically getting all of the extra material, the soil, um, off of the roots so that they're bare. Um, and this allows the plant to integrate more quickly into the ground, into the native soil. Yeah, that's, that's the point. Is, um, all the, a lot of the trees that we're receiving here in New England are actually grown in the south. So it's bringing with it southern clays, you know, and just different soil materials. So um, this gives the plant a leg up um, right from the start of planting it. It's going right into the native soil, not having to break through the soil from where it was grown originally. Yeah, and um, this picture up here, it's kind of dark, but it's a picture of root washing. So it's it's a plant, it's a tree that probably came in a container or was involved in burlap, and it's being soaked in water or rinsed with a hose to get that extra of clay soil off of it. And we'll get more into mulch in the next workshop talk about maintenance, but just um, some things to keep in mind. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> this is a volcano. Uh, yeah. The trunk is probably still building down the like, here. So this is what you should do, which is, you know, create kind of like a saucer around the base of the tree, where um, when you're watering, and you want to water at the base of the plant, whether it's a tree or a shrub. Water at the base, not at the knees way up here. It's just more effective. Um, but creating like a saucer allows water to um, more water to sit there. It's just more effective for watering. Uh, so see a saucer like this. I wanted to just add a little bit. The, the mulch ball came. You see it all over the place. Why? Why is it bad? It's bad because um, it's it's uh, smothering the the trunk. It's not allowing air and water. To, to get to the tree and, and the, um, the, the root system. And it allows uh, a place for critters to go and bury into and start to eat the, the bark and so forth. So it's, you know, it's, it's a thing that landscape contractors, um, I was hoping there would be some here, we can you know, move them away from this practice, but every so often, if you're, if you're mulching every year, you might want to just remove some of the mulch before you put the mulch down. Um, it hasn't broken down enough over time. Um, and so water. It's crucial right after you plant something to be on top of the water and for the first year or even two years. Um, Leslie has a general rule of thumb for caliber size of trees, right? So um, for every caliber inch, every um, so if a, if a tree is like three inches, the caliber is three inches, it takes three years to get it established. So basically that's how long you have to baby it before it'll be good on its own. So um, that's a good rule of thumb for trees, but also just for anything, first to first year, just be consistent with the watering. Um, and you want to water from the base of the plant, not at the leaves. Uh, early morning or in the evening is best because the plant will be able to retain more moisture. If you do it in the middle of the day, it might just evaporate immediately and it's not going to 
towards the wall, the water that you just gave it. Uh, there are things called uh, rain gauges, and they're the really low tech. It's basically a little cup. You stick it has a little point. And you stick it in the ground. That's the low tech, really inexpensive version of a rain gauge to see how much water um, or how much rain you've gotten during the week or month or whatever. Um, there are more high tech ones that are digital, but that's really it's just a little cup. You stick it in the ground or stick a pail out in the yard <laughs> and then shine it so often. Even more low tech. I have a question. Sure. Sometimes you see those bags around trees and they're yeah. just kind of this something good to use. Those are, in my opinion, they give people a false sense of security. Um, when I say contractors love them because they can fill them up and then they just go away and their, their trees get watered. Um, in my mind, it's better to take a hose and soak and saturate the, the saucer. So when we say saucer, it's basically you've dug the hole, you've got excess material, and you basically make a soil little dam around the edge of the, the, the leaf off, you know, or the, the newly planted tree, and you mulch them in there. So by just filling up that little saucer, that's the best method. And you just, it, it slowly soaks back in. Um, the, the gator pads, I suppose if you know, you're going away from it or something, you want to make sure it's water, um, they can do a decent job. So, I'm, I stand up. I'm host. <laughs> it also gives you a chance to go out there yourself and get a close look at it. I'm you from shooting, right? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, every spring, it's like I go around and I kind of look at my yard, I'm like, oh, yay, yeah, you made it. It's like, you know, check it up on your friends, you know, and it's the same sort of thing for a new, newly planted tree. It's, you want to make sure they make it, and um, watering is just one of the most essential parts of the process. Yeah, slowly and Um Tree staking isn't really necessary in most cases. Um, but if you have an especially windy site, or maybe sometimes with like their root trees because they're so, the roots are so small and fragile, you might want to stake, but um, in most other cases, you probably won't need to do this. If, if you do stake, you want to remove the stakes after a year. Don't leave them on longer because the tree needs to be able to move freely and get established on its own. Um, so the stakes kind of and you would die if you leave it on. Ooh, rain gardens. Okay, so <laughs> I love talking about rain gardens. So um, one of the benefits of a rain garden is that they, they control runoff um, and they divert storm water from going into other areas. It's basically um, a depressed area where water can be collected and um, you plant a rain garden so that the plants are what are collecting all the water that is running off into that area. Um, so if you have like stormwater issues, you have like a wet area in your yard, that's a good spot for a rain garden because plants are really great at soaking up excess water. So why not put plants there and make it look pretty and attract pollinators in the process? Um, you can have all sorts of pretty um, plants that are really important and provide a lot of ecosystem services for native uh, birds and bees. So you would want to dig a bowl that's like six to eight inches deep, or you can like, go deeper, but it's just basically, you're just creating a shallow bowl where water is going to be able to sit long enough for the plants to um, soak it up. Uh, and if you're doing it on like, a really steep hill situation, you would kind of want to build a shelf for that rain garden, right? Because if you just, I mean, you can plant on a slope, but it's not really a rain garden at that point. If you, really, you want it to be kind of like a shallow bowl, because the, the water's still just going to keep running off like this if, if you don't build a little shelf for your planting area for your rain garden. Um, and you want to use native species. That's the most important part. Uh, traditional rain garden is native 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 um, perennials, shrubs, trees, native plants. 
a lot of communities um, are requiring you know, retention of, of stormwater. I mean, it's, it's part of the, it's a lot, basically, when you do a new development, you have to, um, the not just runoff it has to be the same after development as before development. So rain gardens have become very popular in the development world to help achieve this. And it also helps to treat the stormwater that's coming off of roads or driveways or whatever. Um, the the um, toxins will get absorbed by the plants and, and remove the toxins from the soil, basically, just by their um, going into the root systems. So it's, it's very uh, popular thing to do now. We we'll see them in um, parking lots and residential areas along the streets. Um, that's a wonderful example of it right there. Um, so we're going to get into the activity shortly. Here's just a quick list of things that we want you to take home with you after you leave today. So do your research on your site. Use Mass Mapper or um, yeah, use Mass Mapper actually. Um, remember how you can capture stormwater and control erosion. You can use rain gardens like we discussed. Um, and rain gardens remove pollutants um, that are in the stormwater runoff. You can do a dry stream bed, a retaining wall. Um, there's things that you can do to prevent um, water from washing all the soil away from your steep slopes in your yards. Use pervious paving. You can use pervious paving like, like the bricks we saw, or the ribbon driveways, or the interlocking pavers, or the permeable asphalt. You can put walkways or driveways, patios. Um, there are applications for any any hardscape that you um, might build in your yard. Uh, and use less paving wherever you can, you know, um, you patio you don't really like, or it's ugly, you, you want to do something new, put a garden bed, put a rain garden, add plants, um, add more uh, natural materials, increase vegetative areas that you know, they go hand in hand, um, and ask questions, ask professionals questions, go to nurseries or ask a designer um, and even after you hire someone, ask them lots of questions. Ask them sustainable questions like, can we use permeable materials? Ask them about things that we talked about today um, to get more sustainable solutions. Um, create a budget. Know how much you want to spend on your project so it's not shocking when you start you know, ordering stuff and buying stuff and it's not at all what you expected. Um, and use sustainable materials, please. And be creative. Use things you already have. Um, buy less. And the book that we are showing up on the screen is a, a valuable resource. It's a terrific book um, and it gives a ton of information um, that goes hand in hand with this guide that we're going to help pull together. Could you, could you talk a little bit about mulch? and what you use, what you recommend? Yeah, um, I think we're, we're definitely going to expand more on it in the next workshop. Do you yeah. want to? Yeah, um, so number one, don't use dyed mulch. <laughs> that is um, all the like dark, dark brown and black mulch is very likely has dyed and dyed. Um, you want natural wood um, mulch. Uh, not too much hardwood, you want it to be bark mulch. Um, there's, there's a bit of a shortage in that material these days and it's getting more expensive, but you want something that's going to um, break down and add nutrients without damaging your soil, which I, the dye and stuff you just don't want to use. So whenever you go to the garden center, just ask that question. And is it hard to find the no, uh, it's they, they have all of it. Usually, if they're a, a reputable garden center, or you know, a large garden center, they'll have all of the they'll have piles of it that you can just kind of look at and then ask the, the owner. And you don't want to get it any more than 
like never bring mulch above the root layer of your plant. Doesn't matter if it's a perennial, a uh, shrub, or a tree. Um, you want to keep the mulch away from the trunk itself for the reasons that we talked about during the, you know, the volcano. Okay, so just to recap before we get into the activity, start small. Don't overwhelm yourself by saying, oh yeah, I'm going to put this new patio in by myself, or I'm going to get all the materials and do it all by myself. No one's going to help me. I definitely can do this in two weeks. Um, be reasonable with yourself, to be honest with yourself. Um, that can be easily accomplished. Um, use the internet. There's so much information out there. If you have a question, Google it. If that doesn't help you, go on Facebook. If that doesn't help you, go to a nursery or find somebody who's, who knows more than you about it. Um, you will be able to find the answers to the things that you're looking for. Or go to the guidebook online. Or go to the guidebook. <laughs> we'll be there in December. <laughs> ready for the spring <laughs> planting season. Right. Don't be your go to. Um, don't be nervous, don't be intimidated because there are people that can help you. Um, ask them questions, and like I keep saying, do what you already have. You know, you can experiment in your yard easily when you just use things that you already have, and it doesn't have to be a big production. So you start small and experiment, and it gives you a good idea of what you can accomplish by yourself, and also what you want to do down the road. All right, so now the fun part. Um, so, like I said, we kind of made this up trying to get people um, thinking about the process of construction. So, uh, the rules are you'll have one hour, which we're up, we started a little late, so we're ready to leave. Um, you'll have $15,000 uh, of, of budget. Um, there'll be a set of points. Um, let's see if you can start passing these. Yeah, you want? Here, I'll pass them. Yeah. All right, so there's um, on each of the, there's a list. There's a do-it-yourself cost. There's a uh, with a contractor cost. There's something going to change and uh, it'll be a solution to the issues or opportunities that you'll see on the, on the sheet. And then for each decision you make, you get a certain number of points. Um, so <laughs> get out your calculator. Um, we can use some paper and pencils. Uh, so the size yeah. of, of these is like 10 feet yeah. across. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. So the root system is going to be at least 10 feet across in the ground. Ah. That's all. Yep. Yep. That one is native, but it's aggressive. Yeah. Okay. Russian olive, you probably find that on your list. Yeah. And then I think you guys already figured out that each each block is uh, 100 square feet. Yeah. Right. I saw you figured that out. Good. Yeah. It's not our yoni, though. No. It is beautiful. You're right. Yeah. Or it's so we've got, we think we've got five trees, but if we replace that, that would be 4,000. So that's almost, we're up to almost 50% of our budget. Super, oh, but you know, if we get a small plant, a smaller tree, then it's much more affordable, plus they'll habituate themselves to their new spot better. So let's go with smaller trees. Okay. We're going to do two columns, DIY. Contractor. All right, so the rain garden will do ourselves. Okay. That's easy. Yeah. I'm going to write down both costs just because. Yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> All right, we're through the exercise, and now Teresa and Brucey are going to kindly describe how they got to their plan and how many points they got and how much it cost. And for that, I'm going to move around behind them, between them, so they can be pointed. So we used a strategy of how could we get the most sustainability points for the least money. 
And we began at the top of the list with invasive tree removal because we saw that we had five invasive trees to remove, uh, including tree of heaven, black locust, and Russian olive. So then we said we can do this ourselves. We were very optimistic that these were not very large mature trees. Um, and next we went to the invasive shrub removal. We counted 11 of those. Asiatic bittersweet, which is actually a vine, but we included it as a shrub. Barberry, burning bush, Japanese honeysuckle. And we took those out ourselves. Next, we started thinking about replacement. And we figured replacing trees with ones that we could plant ourselves would be ideal. So we put in five new trees um, ourselves. These, I guess we, we went for the shade trees. Um, then, and of course, we picked ones that would do the most good for pollinators. I added that. But. <laughs> um, next, we did our 11 new native shrubs, also planting those ourselves. Then we looked on the far over here on this other side of the yard where there's soggy ground and erosion. That's a pretty good space, and it's right near the driveway. So what we did there was, we said, OK, we are going to put in a rain garden in about 2 thirds of that space and deal with the erosion at the far end from the street. Finally, we had some money left over, and we said, well, we're going to start in on that broken up asphalt pavement. And we're going to replace as much as our remaining budget will allow. And that turned out to be 267 square feet. And we put that, we had a contractor do that at $15 a square foot. It was the one thing we decided we just could not handle ourselves. And for that, we came up with a total price of $14,980. Wow. <laughs> and total points, $2,609. All right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's great.